everybody. Welcome to Big Dr. Osborne's Brain. We've got a live Q&A for you. If you've got nutrition questions that you'd like to get answered, go ahead and start typing those into the feed today. If you're new to the show, um, that's the way it works. Now, we had a, a pre-show this week on Tuesday, as we always do. The show's topic was the carnivore diet. So we're going to try to really um, focus heavily on those carnivore diet questions for those of you who have those specific ones. And then we'll do our best to answer others um, if we still have time. Okay, let's dive in. So Rebecca is asking about the lion diet, um, which is basically a ruminant meat and salt only diet. And so the question, or with a, the question is, is that a safe diet? Um, it's not, it's not necessarily that it's unsafe. It's just that it's not for everyone. I think some people do really well um, going just meat and salt. Um, but you, again, as I spoke about on Tuesday, you run the risk of certain deficiencies I know a lot of the carnivore community is really opinionated because they've gone carnivore and they feel really well. And so they defend the diet to their death and, you know, for whatever that's worth. I think, I think blind rhetoric over the diet um, being the one size fits all and people trying to say you're doing the carnivore diet. Cause we got a lot of commentary in the feed, which was you're, people were going on a carnivore diet, not feeling very well. And many of you were. So again, we don't, we don't discredit those of you who were feeling fantastic and we don't discredit those outcomes. Those are real outcomes and those are your real experiences. But then there are people that try to go on this diet and they don't feel well and they don't do well at all. And so then what happens is the people that are adamantly on the side of a carnivore diet start accusing people who didn't feel well on a carnivore diet of doing it wrong. And again, it's, let's try to keep the conversation kind and polite um, some people following that lion style diet do really, really well. Others don't do really well for a variety of different reasons. Some of those I laid out on Tuesday. So um, the bottom line is there's no such thing as a one size fits all diet. Some people do really well with carnivore. Some people don't do really well for whatever reasons those are. It's not because they're doing the diet wrong. Now, are there potentials for detoxification? One of the questions that came up um, was what about oxalate dumping? Is it possible that some people initially going carnivore um, have restricted their diet to such a degree that their oxalate levels um, were toxic and so now they're starting to dump, they're starting to dump oxalates and that can certainly cause a, a symptom profile or a side effect profile that's not comfortable. And um, so the answer is yes, there are people that initially going carnivore might feel worse. We also see the same thing with things like um, gluten. Some people react to going gluten-free as if they are withdrawing from drugs because there's a protein in gluten called gluteomorphin or exorphin that mimics morphine. So when you cut that out of your diet, you can actually go through real drug withdrawals. So there are situations like that one and like the low oxalate or oxalate dumping situation that in that first two to three, maybe even as much as four weeks, a person going on a carnivore diet might feel worse before feeling better. I think if you're trying to give the carnivore diet a good chance, you know, a good three to four week window before you make a judgment call on um, whether or not it's helping you or not is, is a pretty good general rule of thumb. Now, if you're going beyond four weeks and you're miserable and you feel horrible and you're backed up and constipated and don't feel right, it's not that you're doing the diet wrong. It may just be your body trying to communicate to you that the diet isn't right for you. Again, it's not a one size fits all. Everybody needs to listen to how their body communicates and feels. Uh, Lori is asking about oxalates. Just general, con the general comment is I'd like to learn more about them. So maybe if we can put a link up, Lori, we have a master class on oxalates. If you'd like to go check that out, we'll, we'll put a link um, down in the, in the commentary for you. How would this diet affect people without a gallbladder? That's a great question, Linda. Um, so let's just do a little bit of, of physiology 101. So what is the gallbladder? The gallbladder is the, the muscular sac that sits inside of your liver. And um, your liver produces bile and your gallbladder secretes bile in a timed fashion when you eat to help you digest or emulsify fat. So if you don't have a gallbladder, 
you're still making bile. Your liver produces the bile and your liver can even distribute the bile into your small intestine without a gallbladder. However, um, that process can be compromised. So what some people find without a gallbladder is they do not do well on heavy, high fats. It, it actually starts to make them feel bad. So if you don't have a gallbladder, we, we actually use something called Lipogest, and it's a combination of different things, but one of the main ingredients is ox bile. And so basically what you do with a supplement like this is you take it before that higher fat meal so that you're getting the bile down into your intestines to help you emulsify uh, fats that you're, that you're getting ready to eat. Because again, a carnivore diet can be very high in fat um, just by nature of you know the fact that you're eating meats and uh, and high fat, uh, high marbled tissue. Um, does the carnivore diet treat candida? Does it treat candida? I, you know, treatment isn't maybe, okay. Maybe we're parsing words. Does the carnivore diet help with candida? Yeah, it absolutely can. Candida thrives on carbohydrate as a fuel source. So candida ferments carbohydrates in your diet. So if you have a high carbohydrate diet and you have a candida overgrowth, as you eat higher carbs, that candida can actually ferment your carbs and turn it into alcohol. And this is one of the reasons why people do poorly. Um, when they have candida overgrowth, they do poorly because their, their carbohydrate uh, level in their diet is just, is just feeding fuel to that fire. Um, and so going carnivore can help to starve out those candida species, or at least to suppress their ability to get fuel so they can uh, continue to grow. So in that regard, yes. Anytime we're, we're looking at dealing with candida overgrowth, there, there are kind of four generalized strategies I like, I like people to, to attempt to help with it. The first strategy is to flush out the bowel. Uh, the second strategy is to um, starve out the candida. And that, again, a carnivore diet would be a no carbohydrate diet. So definitely would help aid to that purpose. The third strategy would be to use some type of antimicrobial that had an antifungal or anti-yeast effect. So things like oregano, things like thyme or caprylic acid, these are all good options in that regard. And then the fourth strategy would be to create competition for the candidal growth. So uh, the competition for candida would be probiotic, right? The, the different types of bacteria compete for resources with candida. So some people do really, really well using supplemental probiotics in that situation or using fermented foods like sauerkraut. So, okay, so um, Colleen says, um, in a presentation a couple of years ago, you mentioned that there were concerns about keto diets long-term as well. So what diet is recommended as best? There seems to be issues with any of them that are too extreme in limiting food variety, perhaps a Mediterranean diet modified to eliminate gluten and grains. Again, it's a great question. I now wish I could give you an exact answer. There's no such thing as which diet is best. Everybody is different. There are definitely a percentage of the population that can thrive and do really well on a high meat low carb diet, just like there are people in the population that can do really well on a high fat keto diet. And there are people in the population that can do well on a really um, plant based diet or, or a vegetarian based diet. Um, this is why it's so confusing. This is why when you get online and you're trying to do your own research and figure out what diet might best suit you, um, this is why it's so confusing because there are people on all sides and in the middle of the spectrum of diets that are swearing by those diets as being very profound and helping them heal and repair, you know, their illnesses. And so that's the way you kind of have to think about it. When people come to see me in my practice, we, we do a lot of testing to try to help to determine which diet is right for a person. Now, if I'm going to answer that question in a generalized way, I'm very partial and biased because in my practice, I've been practicing for over two decades. Um, we use the no grain, no pain diet, which is it's a, it's think of it, think of it as a hybrid diet. It, it contains no grain. It's legume free. It's dairy free. It's sugar free. It's low oxalate. So in, in all of those regards, you're, you're, it's low lectin, it's low oxalate. It's 
um, no grain, it's no sugar, it's no dairy. So you're removing a lot of the, what we would consider to be the offending food agents or chemicals found in foods that can be problematic for so many. So if you're just generalizing as to a broad spectrum diet to start first, that's where I generally recommend people start first if you're not getting testing done. Because again, as I mentioned on Tuesday, a lot of people that have gone carnivore, why do they feel so much better? Some of them, it's because carnivore is the right move for them to make. But some of them feel so much better because they've been eating shit for 20 years and treating their bodies horribly for 20 years. And just going carnivore removes a vast majority of the offending agents. And so they're swearing by the diet because you know they're no longer getting those exposures. So at, at the end of the day, um, Part of it is your perception of, of that diet and how it's affecting you. And so, again, a lot of people, you know, you can create cult-like attitudes. And I saw that Tuesday with so many of the, the folks that were carnivore. They're just, um, they came out in, in beast mode, in attack mode, just like defending the diet uh, and all of its virtues, no matter what your experience might have been to the negative or derogatory as a result of, of doing it. So, again, I, I don't think any of us can have that attitude. I think we should all be open to one another's ability to have different experiences with different diets and that again i sound like a broken record there's no one size that fits everyone uh let's see here um, there's a protocol recommended prior to doing a mycotoxin test um or is there a protocol you recommend prior to doing a mycotoxin test so there's that's a that's a double-edged sword tracy and let me explain why when you're trying to assess somebody's mycotoxin levels and, and you don't have any historical background information as far as uh, prior tests of mycotoxins and you're trying to rule out whether or not they have a historical exposure storage of mycotoxins in their tissues versus whether or not they're having ongoing exposure from a very toxic environment that's where taking things like glutathione or N-acetylcysteine and saunas can lead to a misrepresentation of what's actually happening. Because if a person, let's say a person's not in mold, but it has a history of being in mold and they're also overweight and remember mold toxins are fat soluble. So this person, maybe they've stored some mycotoxins in their fat. If you try to have them do a test, a urine test, where you do a lot of binding agents and detoxification agents as a prep for the test, what you might be getting back is a result that, it, that shows high, but it's not high because the person's currently being exposed to mold. It's high because their fat cells were storing a lot of mycotoxins and you just drew them out for using products like glutathione. I favor doing the test, if I suspect somebody's living in mold, I favor doing the test without any provocation at all, at least first, um, because I, I really, you know, when you're talking about mold and mycotoxins, one of the worst nightmares is, you know, to accuse somebody's home of killing them and be wrong about it, because then you create undue stress and undue fear uh, and an undue burden financially for that individual. So it's very important that you have the right information or as much of an accurate assessment of the information as possible. And so to do a provocation before doing a test like that could lead you to a false positive that's showing historical mycotoxin exposure versus current or ongoing mycotoxin exposure. I hope that helps you understand that better. How do you think a carnivore diet would affect the microbiome? Is it true that bifidobacteria needs carbs and that meat makes pre uh, proteolytic bacteria grow? We don't know. Um, that's what's that's what's not being studied yet, Monica. Um, it's a it's a fantastic question, and I think it's one that needs to be looked at, and researched, and explored. But I don't think anybody at this point has any definitive data that says if a person's following a carnivore diet, this is the change that we see in their microbiome. Um, we did talk about some research on Tuesday that shows that people that have a certain microbiome tend to do better with a heavier meat-based diet and maybe not as good with heavy fibers and sugars. Um, so there are, there, you know, and that, that, that's probably the closest thing to a research study that we've seen on that particular topic, which is why I, I talked about it. If you missed the show, go back and watch that. But um, 
we don't have enough data to make any broad sweeping accusations about how a carnivore diet affects the microbiome in the long term. I think if we could theoretically say that a person going carnivore might alter their microbiome to downregulate certain species of bacteria that are capable of helping them digest fibers and plant-based sugars and other compounds in plants. And so um, trying to go from full-blown carnivore after potentially a long time and then trying to reintroduce plant-based foods, we might see a transitionary period where a person might feel worse because they have shifted their microbiome. Again, I'm speculating here. I don't know that that happens. I can't make any claims that that happens, but that makes sense. Um, but the good PhDs of the world would have to corroborate that in some trials where they're actually tracking people's microbiomes before going carnivore, after going carnivore, and then trying to make the transition back. What are your thoughts for someone who has Lyme and possibly has alpha-gal syndrome doing the carnivore diet? I think well, if, you, if you've been diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome through definitive testing, then carnivore is probably not going to be the best solution for you and your Lyme situation. Um, so that doesn't mean there can't be an exception, but as a general rule of thumb, it's, it's an, it's an immune reaction. Alpha gal syndrome is an immune reaction to elements of meat. And so if you're having those immune reactions and only eating those meats, causing those immune reactions, it could conceivably cause an autoimmune condition or other health issues to deteriorate. If I can't tolerate gluten on a carnivore diet, can I eat dairy? So depends. Many people who are gluten sensitive also are lactose intolerant, don't have the ability to generate the enzymes effectively that help break down the sugars in dairy. You could be one of those, you, you may not be. Um, you might also be allergic or sensitive to dairy, in which case, you know, carnivore diet, including dairy would not be a good idea. Many people with gluten sensitivity uh, also have dairy allergies and dairy sensitivities. And then there's also the molecular mimicry. So um, dairy can mimic gluten. The proteins have very similar structures. Uh, the casein protein is very similar in structure to the gluten protein. And so, you know, that might also pose as a threat or an issue to you. And then there's also the A2 dairies, which have a different casein molecule and have less of a tendency to create that molecular mimicry to gluten problem. So uh, it's, it's an in-depth question when you, you, and I can't give you an exact answer because I've, I've seen people with carnivore do well eating some dairy, some limited types of dairy. And I've seen people not do well at all with the dairy aspect. So, um, best thing to do would be to test, um, but we also have done, I did a, I did a breakdown on all the pr potential problems with dairy that people have, and you might want to go back and watch that. Does eating much meat increase the chance of developing cardiovascular problems or other problems? Uh, it can, uh, but, but eating meat as a, to say that generically that eating meat causes an increased risk for heart disease is nonsense. And a lot of the um, plant-based community advocates are out there making that statement and trying to promote that as if it's gospel or truth. And it's really, it's just heretics espousing um, rhetoric because there's no scientific evidence that shows that eating meat increases the risk for cardiovascular problems. And there's actually um, plenty of evidence that, that shows that not eating adequate protein, not eating adequate uh, meat in and of itself can increase your risk of certain diseases. Now, question maybe is, is only eating meat pose a risk? And the answer to that is yes and no. And, and for variable different reasons that have nothing to do with the, just the eating meat part, it has to do with all the other variables in life. What else is this person doing to increase their risk of developing cardiovascular problems? Because cardiovascular is, is a complex inflammatory situation. And, it, and I don't think we could just say this one thing that somebody does is going to guarantee an outcome of cardiovascular disease. And as I showed you on Tuesday, I showed you a case study of a, um, of a, of a young woman who had gone on a carnivore diet and had been on it for, for quite a while. And, um, one of the, one of the, let's just say one of the commentaries or several of the commentary critiques of that, uh, case study was that, well, what did her nutrition levels look before going car carnivore? They looked better. We actually have a, 10 year track record of testing that young woman. I wasn't 
we didn't have time in the show to go through her entire 10 year history, nor uh, did I feel like the justification needed to happen that way. But um, her level after going carnivore nutritionally went, it deteriorated. It was not as good. And there were a number of factors involved with that. But, um, you know, some of the commentary also was, well, was she eating enough organ meat or was she only eating lean meats? No, she was eating a diverse array of multitudes of different types of uh, meats and organ meats. And so in her case, you know, it led to more of a nutritional deficit type of issue. That's the whole thing. If, if you go carnivore and it, and it deteriorates your nutrition and part of that nutritional deterioration increases your risk of developing cardiovascular problems, you certainly would want to know that. And then you would want to make accommodations for it. Um, that's why I'm an advocate of testing and not an advocate of, of just pure guesswork. Um, you know, that being said, everybody's going to have a different experience and how they feel and, and, and how they're doing when they change their diet one way or the other. So again, you can't, you also, you can't just do lab testing and ignore how a person feels. And you also cannot ignore how a person feels and just do lab testing. Right. So this is where we, in practice, what we try to do is we combine the subjective experience of the patient, right? I feel better on this diet. I don't have joint pain. I have more energy. Um, you know, some of my labs are deteriorating, but some of my labs are also improving, right? We combine how they're doing and what their perception of how they feel is with solid objective lab data so that we can marry those subjective and, obje and objective data and create the best possible outcomes or scenario for that individual without the mystery of wondering, is this diet long-term potentially going to create a problem? Uh, let's see here. I told my PCM about you and she's impressed. Um, thank you for giving, oh, not a question, more of a, con well, maybe. Um, thank you for giving as much as you do. Appreciated big time. How many zebras follow you? I don't know how many zebras follow us, uh, but thanks for your comment. Uh, Dr. Osborne, do you recommend eating simple sugars to fuel the brain during mentally demanding tasks like writing an exam? Possibly. I mean, I, I find personally, I don't need that in my own, uh, in my own performance. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I have a very high, we'll just say mentally demanding schedule where I'm in clinic 22 hours a week in intense mental conversations and, um, you know, having to use my brain, but I do not find myself requiring heavy amounts of sugars or fruits for that matter to, to fuel myself, to be able to think clearly. Now, there are people that do. There are people that have or perform better with that carbohydrate load, if you will. Again, there's no such thing as one size fits all. I think you have to listen in part. You got to listen to your body. Do you recommend carnivore for someone with MS? No, what I recommend for somebody with MS, which is MS is multiple sclerosis and active autoimmune disease that can crush your quality of life and ultimately kill you. I don't recommend you. I mean, you certainly can go carnivore, but I recommend you get testing done, Darcy. Um, get testing for food sensitivity, get testing on your microbiome, get testing for nutritional deficiencies, get testing for chemical exposures and heavy metal exposures because a carnivore diet is not gonna solve a mercury toxicity if you have one. Um, it's, you know, you, you want to understand what's going on and what are the primary drivers behind why you have autoimmune disease. And some of that might be food. And so going carnivore might solve some of those food issues. Again, as we, as we discussed on Tuesday, a carnivore diet is a gluten-free diet. It's a grain-free diet. It's an oxalate-free diet. It's a low lectin diet. It has a lot of benefits for a number of the different, you know, food reactions that people have, but it doesn't resolve chemical damage. It doesn't necessarily re resolve nutritional, the pre-existing nutritional deficiencies, and it doesn't necessarily resolve major microbiome dysfunction or disruptions that could also be contributing to multiple sclerosis. So again, when you have an active disease that can threaten your life, um, you don't want to mess around. It's not a do it yourself project. And I know a lot of you may be saying, well, you know what? My doctor sucks. They're not helpful. They haven't, you know, listened. They won't run the tests that I'm asking them to run. And I get it. It's frustrating when you want to be able to go to a doctor and get guidance, but the guidance you're getting isn't good guidance or is just drug-based guidance. Take this drug, reduce your symptom, and then go away and leave me alone. Um, you got to find a doctor who does functional care. And that that's sometimes, you know, 
harder to do. It's e easier said than done, but it's worth the effort in trying to find somebody. Um, you know, if you're looking, you can't find anybody consider you. I mean, you could all consider, you know, calling my office. Uh, we're, we're booked out quite a ways, but, um, you know, we're not, we're not, not, we're not going to stop taking on new cases. That's just part of my promise. I'm not, not like other celebrity doctors where they get to a certain level and retire. I have no intentions of ever retiring because to me, part of, part of the gift of, of understanding this stuff is it's, it's a, it's a responsibility and, you know, we have to use our gift as, um, as a tool to help others. And if we abandon it, um, you know, that, that to me doesn't make sense to abandon it. So people need one-on-one -on -one help. Have you ever considered hosting a no grain, no pain retreat with gluten-free work, cooking workshops, guest speakers, talking about a variety of health topics, the latest and greatest on supplements and testing? I, I have, uh, it's just that my plate and my, my bucket is full right now. Um, we're trained actually in the process of training a clinician right now. Um, because it is something that, that we desire to do to, to help more people, but um, just not something that's going to happen in the next six months. Uh, is that testing through you, doctor? Yeah, I mean, we do all that testing, Darcy. That's part of what we do here. Um, you, we also have made some of that testing commercially available directly to you without a doctor's note. And you can, if you're not, not familiar with us, you can visit us at glutenfreesociety.org. And there's a, there's a tab at the top of the page that says laboratory testing. And if you click that, there are certain labs that we currently offer direct to consumer. It's not all the labs that I recommend clinically speaking, but it can get you a good head start if you're, um, if you're looking at it. I'm a fan of grass fed beef. If you accidentally eat grain fed beef, will you get the gluten grains in your body? Some pieces of ribeye, I get a reaction in my small intestine. No, there's no, I haven't seen any research that shows that eating grain fed meat exposes you to gluten directly. Um, now on the, uh, if you're eating grain fed meat, what it does expose you to is a higher level of pesticide. Um, what it can potentially expose you to is, is, um, uh, oxalate accumulation in the meat. And so if you're oxalate intolerant, that, that might be something that you're also experiencing. What it can also expose you to is mycotoxins in the meat of the animal who's being fed heavy grain that also can be contaminated with mold and mycotoxins. You're also getting a high, um, a high ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, which can um, drive the inflammatory balance of your body in the wrong direction. So there's a lot of potential reasons to not eat grain-fed beef aside from the human, you know, the animal, um, welfare reasons those animals those, those grain fed you know feedlot cattle are are treated horrifically if you've ever been to a feedlot you you know exactly what i'm talking about um so it's always best to buy grass fed grass finished because those animals are treated more ethically they're more humanely treated they're they're out there in the grass in the sun um eating what god intended them to eat without all the nonsense chemicals and garbage um I hear that B12 is better when it's a lozenge and is put under the tongue is, is if yes, is that the kind, uh, you have? Yeah, we have several kinds, Maria, but the answer is yes. B12 is absorbed orally through the buccal mucosa. So it's not just under the tongue, but it's also absorbed through the cheeks. Um, and so we have several different versions. We have a methylcobalamin. We have something called, um, Ultra B12, which is a, a hydroxycobalamin for some of those that don't tolerate methylcobalamin. Um, and so those are, are examples of lozenges. We also have a B complex, which is an oral tablet that you swallow. And um, it also has B12. But it, again, if you're looking for enhanced absorption, the lozenge is a better bet, especially if you have a history of gluten sensitivity or celiac disease, because the area that absorbs B12 in your intestine is damaged by gluten. And so a lot of people have B12 deficiencies because of that damage. So you're bypassing that area when you take a lozenge. When I look up wild rice on Google, it says it's a grain. Is that true? No, true wild rice is not a grain. Can I do the carnivore diet without a gallbladder? Yes, you, you can. You can certainly try. And if you find yourself with a lot of digestive stress um, because of the higher fat content, you can consider using um, an ox bile supplement, something like Lipogest. 
Um, but you can certainly make the attempt. Now, again, pay attention to how your body reacts and, and does and look, make sure you're paying attention to your stools, that um, your stools are not turning like a super tan color or a, almost like a, uh, a light brown color because that would be an indication potentially of fat malabsorption. And um, again, without that gallbladder, that's where you can run into a problem. So sometimes that supplemental ox bile is very helpful uh, and for some necessary. What's the difference between ultra magnesium and clear mag? Which one is better? They're both different. So it's not which one is better. It's which one serves the need that you're trying to serve. Um, if you're just generally trying to get a good quality magnesium supplement, that's not going to cause you diarrhea for, through a massive osmotic action. Ultra MG is a good multi-purpose is four different types of magnesium. So, you know, that part of the reason why we offer the diverse array of different types of magnesium is, is to uh, make sure that your body can utilize it well. As far as clear mag is concerned, it is magnesium bound to um, something called three and eight. And what that does is it helps get the magnesium past the blood brain barrier. So if you're trying to improve your mental focus, concentration, mental energy, improve your sleep, this is where a clear mag might support you better in that regard. So again, think of clear mag as brain magnesium and think of ultra MG as body magnesium. And if you think of it that way, you can make the best decision that matches your need. How can I order your multis? I tried to order before, but no availability here in Spain. We're working on a, um, we're working on a solution globally. Um, be patient with us. Um, as of right now, you cannot get it in Spain because um, because the, the um, well, we'll just say the um, the the hurdles that we're running into with um, with customs. Is it true that it is okay to not have regular bowel movements on the carnivore diet? I was told the reason being is that your body actually utilizes all the nutrients. Because so much horse, I'm I'm sorry, I don't mean to say it. There's so much horse shit out there online. Um. <laughs> Let me finish reading the question. I was told the reason being is that your body actually utilizes all the nutrients from the meat and therefore there is no waste. Nonsense. You're not using, uh, you're not using it so much better and more efficiently that you don't poop. Um, there's always going to be byproducts of waste from any food that you eat. If you are constipated on a carnivore diet, you might want to consider why that's happening. And there are a number of different reasons that it could be. Some people on a carnivore diet don't get enough salt uh, and that alters their bowel motility and can create a constipation. Some people alter their microbiome. Uh, we've actually done some in-house measuring and we've seen some changes in microbiome on carnivore diets where it can pose a risk for some, for an increased risk of uh, constipation. We also know that some people, the carnivore diet is not right for 100%. They need some fiber. They need some plant-based nutrients in their diet as well in order for their bowel to have healthy movements. So again, if, if you are backed up, if you're not having daily bowel movements, that could pose a problem. Remember, when you have um, digestive processes going on around your food, if that food sits in you too long, it does putrefy. Just like if you leave it out on the counter too long, what happens to it? The oxygen and the light start to deteriorate it. The different environmental bugs start to deteriorate and eat it, and it starts to stink. That's called putrefication. It happens in your gut with anything that you eat. Uh, and if you're not pooping regularly, then it stays inside of you, and some of those byproducts have the ability to contribute to a breakdown of your intestinal lining, leading to leaky gut, and then the host of problems that can come afterwards. So if you're finding yourself super constipated, you might want to ask yourself whether or not that diet is the right diet to follow specifically uniquely to you. Is shellfish twice a week good contribution to iodine levels? Yeah, you're going to get good iodine from shellfish. You're also going to get it from, from other ocean fish. Um, iodine is rich in, in all ocean-based fish. Not quite sure how gluten shield works. Will it help if you eat grass-fed beef or organic chicken? And if it's fed... Okay, so the way it works, Debbie... It one, there are enzymes in it that are proteolytic. So if you're using it to help you digest beef or chicken, it, it's going to help, okay, because there are proteolytic enzymes in it to help you break down um, the proteins from those meats. It is not designed, and so, so again, I think part of the misconfusion is if you're eating uh, a chicken that was fed grains, does taking gluten shield protect you from the grain 
that the chicken ate. Now, again, we don't have any direct evidence or knowledge that says that if an animal eats grain, that there's going to be gluten in that meat. So that's not what gluten shield is for. Gluten shield is for two primary purposes. One, it's a dig it's a multi-purpose digestive enzyme. And number two, it is used as a preventative or protective um, if you are traveling or eating out and you aren't sure, you think the food's gluten-free, you ordered it gluten-free, um, but again, there's always the potential for human error and cross-contamination. So it's designed to be a buffer for cross-contamination. It's not designed to help a person eat pizza or a Subway sandwich. A lot of companies market their gluten enzymes that way, and they're liars. They're, they're, they're misrepresenting what the product is actually capable of doing. You want to understand that Gluten Shield is designed to help you if you eat other people's food to reduce the potential risk of that cross-contamination of gluten damaging your GI tract and creating problems for you. But it is not designed to help you eat gluten. I hope that clarifies it for you. Let's see here. Can blood type O fare well on a carnivore animal-based diet? I'm struggling with gluten and dairy, but feel better with high fat foods and meat. Basically, my question is, do blood types matter? They can. There are some people with type A blood types that do really well on a carnivore diet. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, and this is not, again, this is, think of type A and type AB blood types, and that's whether, whether they're positive or negative, um, as blood types that don't have how do I want to explain this? Some people are good at some things and bad at others, right? Everybody's got gifts, talents. Everybody's got things they're not great at. So, for example, somebody might be really great at sprinting, but they're not really great at running long distances and vice versa. You might have somebody who's really great at running long distances, but not great at sprinting. Their strengths and weaknesses are different. Well, think of A's and AB types as their strength is not stomach acid production in mass. And so that poses a potential risk for them not being able to break down the meat if they're eating high, large quantities of, of animal meats. Now, that doesn't mean that a person with an A blood type or an AB blood type can't do carnivore or may not be successful with it. It just means knowing that allows you to have an understanding. And this was one of the other comments earlier was, you know, I'm on a carnivore diet and I'm constipated. Well, if your blood type is A or AB, that may be the case. And so if you want to stay on a carnivore diet, you've got to figure out why you're constipated. For some with those blood types, taking acid as a supplemental before eating might be beneficial and aid in, in the digestion of that extra meat or using something like apple cider vinegar before the meal that it is a mild acid or you can use something like betaine hydrochloride. But there's no... Um, if you're type O, you know, the, the general rule of thumb with type O is type O's are really good at producing stomach acid. So they're actually the blood type from that perspective is a good match for uh, higher meat intake. Try to go gluten free. It made insomnia worse. What can I do? Um, you might be having gluten withdrawals. In that regard, um, again, it's not uncommon to see that when people react to gluten exorphin um, uh, and then they cut out gluten, they, they feel worse for the first three to four weeks. Um, you know, the best thing you can really do is get tested to try to figure out what else might be going on that's contributing to that insomnia as well. Um, cause you, you may, you may be missing some key things, some key elements that, um, could improve your sleep. You might also want to check out our sleep crash course. Maybe we can put a link up for her. How long can you do carnivore without affecting your nutrition status, but letting your gut heal? I mean, you can, you can do carnivore as long as you um, feel good doing carnivore. I think if you're, again, the, the takeaway message here, Yesenia, is if you're going to do carnivore, you monitor your levels of things. Make sure it's not, you know, not contributing to some potential pitfalls for you that, you know, you might have to correct in the future. I mean, we see this on the other aisle of the spectrum. We get it a lot with people that follow plant-based diets for years, right? And you see, I see this a lot in my clinic where somebody, maybe they were on a vegetarian or vegan diet for two years, three years, 10 years. And what ends up happening is, you know, at some point of them following that diet over long periods of time, their body starts to break down because the nutritional deficit 
or the damage of that diet took time to manifest as problematic. It didn't, they don't, they didn't just die the next day. They didn't just develop severe symptoms the next day because they were following that particular restricted diet. And it took some years to manifest. We see that a lot. And I know many of you in the carnivore community um, will, will ha that will be one of your arguments because maybe some of you went carnivore because you tried plant-based and did so horribly after two years or after three years. Well, the, you know, the verdict is out still. We don't have enough data or long-term research on people on a carnivore diet indefinitely to understand fully who's impacted and who's not impacted. But I can't imagine that there's people out there going carnivore that they're not going to pay a price if they're not monitoring these things in three or four years or five years or even two years. Again, I showed you a case study earlier this week where the deficiencies were piling up and there was still gut inflammation. And this gut inflammation was actually worse than before that person started the carnivore diet. So again, it's, it's not a one size fits all diet. Um, it's a smart thing to measure and to monitor Anytime you do any kind of restrictive diet, I don't care what it is. I don't, even if it's my no grain, no pain diet, it's a smart thing to measure and monitor your nutrition and your gut health as you're going through it. This way you head off potential issues that might come up and it allows you to make meaningful changes around your diet as opposed to just generalizing and wishing for the best to, to be the outcome. What's your opinion on carnivore diet and increased Fertility, I've heard it can boost fertility. So part of that, um, we see this all the time. One of the most common causes of unexplainable infertility is actually gluten sensitivity. Gluten um, damages many people it, and it damages the endocrine system. So it can hinder the ability to generate hormones that aid in fertility. Um, and and this, is, this has been really well studied. There's a, there's a subset of illness caused by gluten called polyendocrine syndromes that can cause unexplainable infertility. And so I believe that many people going carnivore that are seeing improvements in fertility, they're seeing those improvements in the large part because it's a gluten-free diet and they're benefiting from that. Is beef liver twice or three times a week enough B12, iron, et cetera, for your body? What's the size? I mean, how much beef liver? Are you talking about an ounce, two ounces, six ounces? Um, because the, the quantity is going to matter. And is it enough? It just depends. Everybody's different. It might be enough for some and might not be enough for others. What tests do you recommend people do when they are just starting to starting the journey to understand their microbiome? Um, get with a good doctor because a lot of the tests that are sold online, in my opinion, are very misleading. Technology is very misleading. And, and so you don't really get a, 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 an accurate, true assessment of your microbiome. Uh, so work with a doctor who does a lot of microbiome testing is basically what I would recommend that you, you do. Is tinnitus a symptom of a particular nutrient deficiency that you know of, maybe a neurological one? It can be. I've seen tinnitus go away um, with vitamin B12. I've seen it go away with folate. Uh, I've seen it go away with vitamin B1. I've seen it go away with vitamin D. I mean, these, these nutrient deficiencies certainly can play a role in how the nerve functions. And a lot of tinnitus is neurological in, in nature. I've also seen tinnitus be caused by parasites and heavy metals and gluten. Um, so it just depends. Everybody's tinnitus, again, there's no such thing as a, everybody has tinnitus for the exact same reason. Um, you know, there, it's, it, think of it as nerve inflammation. Right, and so then when you backtrack that that thought, it's like, well, what causes your nerve inflammation? Well, maybe it's what you're eating, maybe it's what you're being exposed to, maybe it's what you're not eating, right? So those are all the potential possibilities. How do people with MTHFR gene go on the carnivore diet? The same way people without the MTHFR uh, mutation do. Um, there's no risk of doing carnivore if you have MTHFR mutation, um, especially if you're eating organ meats, because you're going to get lots of good quality folate out of, especially out of the liver. Somebody says, been carnivore three weeks. Tinnitus is much worse and sore eyes. It sounds like you might be oxalate dumping. That can be a side effect. We get that the eyes can be affected a lot with oxalate dumping, especially if what you're seeing is a lot of granulation coming out of your tear ducts or if it feels like you're closing your eyes and it's sandpaper in nature, like it feels that way, that, that could very well be oxalate. 
So a lot of people too have have um, hard like lesions start to form uh, underneath the skin and then they bust open and they're like a crystalline like structure. That would be also uh, a symptom of potential oxalate dumping. So that may be what you're experiencing. Um, what some people find is more helpful instead of just going full bore carnivore um, is to continue to eat certain plants, certain foods, you know, go low oxalate with, with maybe a focus on some meat, um, but don't go no oxalate, which is what a carnivore diet is to try to avoid that potential for a severe oxalate dumping effect. Again, this is one of this groupings of symptoms that are not uncommon in people trying to, to go full, full blown carnivore, you know, overnight cold Turkey without doing a kind of a transition. How successful are people who went carnivore to heal gut dysbiosis be at reintro a variety of fruits and veggies again? Pretty successful. I see it quite a bit. Um, I think again, a lot of the benefits of, of the carnivore diet are because of its restrictions and the commonality of, of what those things being restricted are and how they can impact a person's health. But once a person reestablishes their gut dysbiosis and their microbiome uh, in a healthy manner, a lot of times they redevelop a, a, a tolerance, a retolerance, if you will, of reintroducing new foods. And you know, I think that's, in my opinion, in my experience, that's arguably the best place for most people to, to aim for. I'm going to school for naturopathic, um, just started. I want to help others overcome food intolerances because it's been such a struggle for me. Any advice on classes? Take them all. You can't overeducate yourself. I mean, part of it is, you know, when you go into any kind of classroom environment is um, go in with an open mind and go in with um, a humbleness and a, and, a, and a willingness to learn, but also go in not being scared to ask questions or to question the status quo or the, or the standard paradigm, because all schools are guilty of teaching dogmatic beliefs. Um, and this is part of the problem with school. I, I always said, School is where you go to learn to learn. It's not where you go to stop learning. Like a lot of people get their degree and then they think, oh, I have my degree, therefore I am the master of this particular you know, topic. And in reality, school is just a really great place to go and learn how to learn. And once you know and understand how to learn, then your, your school is your life, right? Your school becomes lifelong. And for me, probably the best school I ever went to um, day in and day out to learn about nutrition was with my patients. It was one-on-one. -on -one. It was being humble enough as a doctor to be able to listen to them and to listen to their feedback and not just be right. Um, and, and to see outcomes for various different reasons. And sometimes those outcomes didn't make sense until you allowed your, your mental blocks to come down and be open to other possibilities. So go into it with that attitude and then read. Um, I probably read 20, maybe not quite that much, 15 hours a week. Um, easy um, in research, um, and that's through you know the National Library of Medicine, PubMed. Um, you know, I, I like to stay up to date, and I like to read and uh, consume literature voraciously because it helps me stay sharp, and it helps me apply new thoughts and concepts when I go into practice every week. So, stay hungry. Don't ever think you've ever hit a knowledge level where you no longer need to learn. When you stop growing, you start dying, and that's really the gist of it. Just diagnosed with lupus and RA, I have no pain. So is methotrexate necessary? <laughs> like I, you know, I can't give you medical advice here on this, but if you're pain-free, the whole point of methotrexate is to reduce pain and improve quality of life. It's, it's what's known as a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. Now, your rheumatologist will probably tell you that you're taking it so that your joints aren't destroyed 10 years from now, but nobody can predict the future. And um, this includes your, your rheumatologist. And so don't take the drug out of fear that maybe your joints will be destroyed in 10 years. If that's their fear, then set up once a year an annual x-ray um, that allows you to track and monitor whether or not your joints are deteriorating, even though you're, you're, you're not having pain. But going on the drug um, for the fear that one day your joints might deteriorate when you're completely asymptomatic doesn't make sense to me. And it doesn't come without side effects. Methotrexate destroys the gut lining. It blocks folate. 
And um, it really sets the stage for a leakiness or a leaky gut to occur, which then can perpetuate and multiply into other autoimmune diseases in your future. Those are all possibilities. So just taking it without, without the justification of improving your quality of life, in my opinion, it's not something I would do. Do you have tips on how to improve gallbladder health and bile flow when eating high fat carnivore? Um, well, just the nature of eating high fat is gonna, gonna provide neurological stimulation to your liver and gallbladder for bile flow. So um, if you're trying to stay carnivore, I mean, one of the things that can improve bile flow and bile excretion is bitters. And that, again, those are plant-based products that if you're trying to be carnivore, not gonna do you any favors. Um, you might you might attempt smelling bitters and, and you know with smell you can sometimes get a, a, a stimulation as well like a, our sense of smell can stimulate uh, those same hormonal messages the, the sense of smell and then once we start chewing those hormonal messages start triggering the liver to to make bile and for the bile to be released by the gallbladder so Yeah, if you if you have a lot of soreness below your right rib cage, you might consider getting an ultrasound of your liver and gallbladder just to see if you have any sludge or stone formation that you know that you know you want to certain things you can do about that. One of the one of the things that can really be supportive of that type of issue is making sure you have adequate vitamin C, and also making sure you have adequate taurine. So maybe potentially even having those things measured. What's the benefit of, to take MCT oil? I mean, aside from just providing a source, an energy substrate for the intestine to use, you, you, you ideally, I'm not a fan of oils. I'm not a fan of taking extra oils. One oil that I recommend that people take on the regular, and, and that's simply because, you, you know, over two decades of laboratory testing have, has shown me that, that, people who don't supplement with omega-3 fatty acids generally have low omega-3 fatty acid levels, no matter what they attempt in their diet to do. Um, but I'm not a fan of, beyond that, I'm not a fan of really much of any processed oils. If you want, it, you want MCT oil, eat the foods that contain it more than taking the supplement. Dr. Osborne, will you add magnesium citrate to your vitamins? We have magnesium citrate. It's in our Ultra MG. It's it's um, a mixture of magnesium citrate and uh, magnesium glycinate and magnesium ascorbate and magnesium alkyl. So um, that is in that product. You might want to relook at that, Mary. Um, if you're a kidney stone developer, depending on the type of kidney stone, it, you know, 80% of kidney stones are calcium oxalate stones, and they're not formed as a result of not having magnesium as much as they're formed as a result of overconsuming oxalates. So you might also consider watching uh, our class on oxalates. You might also consider, you know, oxalates are produced by different species of molds and yeast. And if you have uh, a mold problem or a yeast overgrowth problem, you might have an oxalate factory in your body that's that's driving the formation of those stones. And again, magnesium citrate's not going to stop them from forming. Um, hope that helps you. What's the best sleeping position? The one, the best sleeping position is the position that allows you to sleep soundly and peacefully through the night. Um, you know, whether you're sleeping on your left or your right or on your back, which position is the most comfortable for you that allows you a, a peaceful night's sleep. There's not a best magic position. Uh, scroll down just a little on the left for me. Is it true the large portion of the, of the population is deficient in iodine and how does one know if they're deficient? You can do our nutritional testing, Pamela. There's also something called an iodine loading test, which is a urine test after taking a 50 milligram bolus of iodine that can be helpful for understanding your iodine needs. 
Um, those are two great ways to take it. But yeah, many people are low in iodine because they don't eat seafood, they don't eat ocean food, and they don't eat foods that contain iodine. And that iodine is not traditionally guaranteed to be in the soil. We have, like in the in the Midwest and the in the U.S., we have an area of the country called the goiter belt, um, which is an area where there's no iodine in the soil, or not no, but but very little. And so the diets there can be problematic and create iodine deficiencies that lead to goiters. That's why we fortify table salt with, with, um, with iodine uh, was because that was discovered in the early 1900s that um, the soil there was depleted. So people were developing goiters. Would you recommend someone positive for SIBO for hydrogen and methane? You mean, I don't know what you're, I don't understand your question because a positive SIBO test would mean that you tested positive for hydrogen and methane gas levels um, on a breath test. Um, so if you're asking me, should somebody with suspected SIBO take a hydrogen methane gas test, you could, um, you know, and it might help give you some determination. Um, but again, it's hard to discern what your question is. I had symptoms suddenly occur after a car accident, never had them before. Well, then you might have somato visceral problems. So you can have damage structurally to your body after a, 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 an accident, whether it's a car accident or a fall or, or any other type of physical injury that can translate into organ dysfunction. Um, at the name, there's a name for it. It's called somato visceral disease. Um, and so, you know, that is a possibility. You might want to look into um, getting checked out after the accident to see if you've got, you know, any type of soft tissue adhesions or scar formations or other problems that could be contributing to that, uh, to those symptoms and get that and get yourself physically treated. How do you know if you're producing appropriate amounts of digestive enzymes and stomach acid is their testing? Um, the, the testing for stomach acid, you can now do, a, it's not really testing for stomach acid, but it is measuring the pH of the stomach. And so they now have pill endoscopies. These are pills that, you know, you can take in and they will measure the pH in your stomach. And so it will, might give you the general idea of, of whether or not your stomach is too acidic or not acidic enough. Uh, as far as testing for digestive enzymes, yes, there are blood tests that can measure lipase and amylase and tryptase. There's, there's stool tests that can measure elastase. I mean, there's plenty of uh, tests available to measure for enzymatic function. I'm going to Ethiopia soon. What's the best antibiotic to get in case? I mean, the best antibiotic to get is talk with your doctor to determine, um, you know, what your antibiotic history is. But I, I'm not a big fan of of the just in case um, antibiotic use, because if you get traveler's diarrhea, it doesn't still doesn't necessarily constitute that you need an antibiotic. Sometimes traveler's diarrhea will self resolve. Um, what I like to travel with if I'm going somewhere is a very potent probiotic. And that way, if something hits me, I, I start with the probiotic first before jumping right to the, uh, the antibiotic. You might also consider some natural antibiotic options. Um, and I, I can give you an example. Um, so for probiotic, I would take some like ultrabiotic defense, which is very high dose. And for the traveler's diarrhea component, we have a product called intestinal defense, which is a mixture of different herbals that can have antibiotic properties. Uh, and so that would be something that I personally would take with me uh, if I knew I was going out of town and wanted to have kind of a backup plan. And then if those things fail, then you might you know, consider the antibiotic again, of course, if, if it's a bacterial infection. Is chickpea pasta okay to eat on a gluten-free diet? It is, it's gluten-free, but um, a lot of these chickpea pastas just aren't good for people. They're highly processed foods. And um, again, I'd rather see you eat like a chickpea hummus or chickpeas than, um, than use a lot of these processed pasta, pasta products. How much protein is the most I can safely consume? There's not, it, one, it depends on the person. Um, you know, generally think of it, Dahlia, as, you know, it's pretty safe to eat one and a half grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, you know, and, and, but there are caveats to that, but, but that's generally a pretty safe uh, place to be.
If I did three a three month detox six months ago through Cellcore and now figuring out I am living in a moldy house, did the detox do any good? No. Number one rule of detox, Melissa, is you can't detox while you're retoxing. It just doesn't do any good at all um, because it doesn't solve for the mold. So if you know you found out you're in mold, number one thing you can do to detox is step one, get out of the mold. Then step two, you know you can consider things to aid in detoxification. I have, I can't have vegetables because I have diverticular pouches and vegetables create a flare. Would eating just meat, fish, eggs, and chicken be enough? I can't eat salads either. Possibly it would be, Sue. I mean, if you're going to do that, though, get get tested. Uh, check your nutrition status. Um, the, other, the other consideration, you know, with those out pouches like that, would some people with diverticulitis find very helpful um, is pureeing, um, pureeing the food and liquefying it so that it doesn't lodge into the diverticuli and create a flare for you. Is it best to go with your instincts when it comes to cravings for certain protein? I'd say your instincts are your guide, right? It's your Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder. It's always, it's always a good idea to go with your instinct. Trust, try to trust your instinct and try to learn how to listen to it. I mean, could it be wrong sometimes, but um, it's, it's, it's always the first place you should start. I answered this one already. Um, no gallbladder. Do you recommend certain supplements? Well, we have one called Lipogest, which is what, what I recommend for people without gallbladders who are trying to help support their fat um, absorption. Does eating butter help with joint pain? If the nutrients in the butter are providing deficient you're if it are providing nutrients that you're deficient in that relate to how your joints are forming or regulating inflammation it might but i wouldn't go eating go around eating you know butter as as a as a means to try to treat your joint pain um but you know i've not i've not seen anybody go on a butter diet and, and solve their arthritis as an example um but it, it's a weird question i guess um, I'm hypothyroid on desiccated thyroid over 20 years, type A blood other than low acid. Are there other drawbacks for my blood type? I'm 90% carnivore now and tapering off the meds. Um, not really. I mean, if you're feeling better, doing well, being able to taper off your meds, going in that direction, more power to you. You know, the biggest draw, any drawback, right? As we've said repetitively, any drawback to, to a restriction diet would just be monitor your nutrition and be intelligent about it so that you prevent the potential possibility of a long-term deficit that might deteriorate your health in another way that, you know, doesn't show up for, you know, six months, 12 months, tw you know, two years, et cetera. Uh, what does the carnivore diet contain? It contains animal products. So any kind of meat, um, it contains dairy, it contains egg, um, you know, those, those are the gist. It's basically animal, animal meats or animal products. I don't live in a country where I can get a complete nutritional panel, which nutrients are key to test all of them. I mean, honestly, there's, you know, do the best that you can, you know, check what you have available to you, um, Lila or Lita, but, um, but all of them are important because any nutritional deficiency can cause problems. What may be the reason why someone who does the meat only diet gets rid of mental struggle? Define mental struggle. You mean mental anguish or mental um, stress? Um, it could be that you're eliminating the foods that were creating a biochemical stress and that allowed your mind to think more clearly, work more clearly and function better and, and feel better. Um, again, think of stress. There's three flavors of stress. There's chemical stress, mental stress, and um, physical stress. And where a lot of people's stress is coming from 
is their food, but it's perceived as mental stress, right? Because we can perceive stress mentally, even though it might be coming biochemically from our food. I mean, we see this all the time, people with gluten sensitivity who have bipolar, schizophrenic tendencies and anxiety disorders. And when they go gluten-free, their mind clears and they can think and they don't have that level of stress. Can you add B6 and magnesium to your vitamins? We already have B6 and magnesium in ours. Um, our multivitamins contain both, Mary Ellen. You might check out multinutrients. I'm wondering if you have any opinion on the, uh, taking strontium for bones to avoid osteoporosis. Uh, yeah, I do. We actually did a show on bone loss here recently that you might want to go check out. And we did talk about strontium uh, to a certain extent in that show. But strontium is a great nutrient. We actually test for the deficiency of strontium. And it's not uncommon that we see people with you know, accelerated bone loss having strontium deficiencies. And so I am a fan of using strontium supplementally in those individuals. Is fiber really necessary? For some it is, and you know, some would argue that it's not. I, you know, I, I tend to go back to, the, there's, there's, there are always outliers. There will always be freaks of nature, people that can smoke for 100 years and not die of lung cancer or, or lung problems. Just like there will be people that can eat an all meat diet and feel fantastically great and do well. Just like there will be people that can eat an all plant-based diet and do fantastically well. As a general rule of thumb, don't count on the fact that you're a freak of nature outlier and take the risk of damaging your health over your entire life by having a dogmatic opinion about something. I think when we get into dogmatic belief systems, as we saw in the last several years with, you know, with the infection and the pandemic, I mean, there's so much dogma and there's so much polarity, right? And people, there are people that believe in things and people that don't believe in things. And then there's everything in the middle and in between. And we see the same kind of polarity occurring in the diet realm. Don't fall prey to dogmatic belief systems. Nature is set up as a balance. And if you look anywhere in nature, anytime you go to one end of the spectrum and lose balance, there's a deterioration of life, not an enhancement of life. And again, that's not to say some of you are, are observing how you feel incorrectly and not benefiting from the diet changes that you're making. It's just simply to say that don't, don't go into things, don't go into your whole life with dogmatic belief system that you're not open to humble yourself to learning. It's where, you know, we, again, we see that same thing in the vegetarian community where it takes two years for them to develop a B12 deficiency because their liver stores B12. And at about two years, they start to develop neuropathies. And they start to develop other health issues associated with that loss. But it took two years for it to happen. Don't allow your, um, your immediate zest for any diet cloud your judgment that the world is set up on the premise of balance. And so you always want to look at balance as a place to try to stand and hold and be intelligent about how you make decisions, keeping that in mind. How accurate are bone density tests? Bone density tests are, um, are very accurate. They measure how much x-ray your bone absorbs. Now, the question is not whether or not bone density tests are accurate. The question is whether or not using bone density tests to assess the quality of your bone is the end all be all belief of, of what makes bone quality good. I, I would argue, as I have, and you can go back and watch my bone class, that if you're relying on a bone density test to diagnose, to diagnose whether or not you have osteoporosis, you're doing it wrong. And a lot of doctors do it wrong. A lot of doctors make the mistake of saying, of scaring patients into bone drugs because they have a bone density score that's low um, or, or, you know, I should say low, not bone density that's low or bone density score that's high, negative three and a half, negative two and a half, depending on, on, um, on the person. But they're a tool to help to assess an aspect of bone, but they're not the definitive marker that says this is the health of your bone. In other words, you can do bone scans, but you should also couple that with urine crosslinks, peridinium crosslinks, osteocalcin. You should also couple that with nutritional testing to assess your minerals and your B vitamins, because all of these things are factors in how your body replicates and, um, and builds healthy bone. 
And if you don't have a complete picture, then what you, most people end up doing is end up on one of these drugs that increase the way their bone shows up on a bone density test, but destroys the quality of the bone. So you have this bone that absorbs x-ray better, but it's more brittle. And so it tends to increase the risk of people developing fracture. And you don't want that either. Uh, let's see. Heating mostly carnivore along with wild caught fish, microgreens, ferments, um, some supplements, Celtic sea salt in the water. Can I maintain good nutrition and vitamin levels eating this way? Probably, but again, the best way to know for sure would be to test yourself periodically. I'm a big fan of twice a year testing. Every six months, I have my blood drawn. I want to know what my nutritional status looks like. Because even, even if I'm eating the best diet for me, which I believe I am based on years of experience and, and years of testing, um, there will always be life variables that come into play. You might have a two-month period of time where you're super stressed. You might, maybe you're increasing your exercise. Maybe you get in a car accident. Maybe you fall and strain or sprain your ankle. You know, these types of variables that occur in our lives either can increase or decrease our need for certain nutrients. And so this is another one of the big variable patterns that if you observe your nutrition status over time and you have an objective analytical way to look at it so that you can make real world adjustments to your diet and potentially to your supplements, that's the best of all worlds. Um, otherwise, it's not like which supplement do I take to be perfect forever? Like your nutrition's not static, it's dynamic and it's based on you know, the variable a sundry of things that can happen to you as you navigate life. Okay, we got more questions, but we don't got more time. Look, I hope you appreciated today's show and got something from it. If you did, make sure you hit that thumbs up button below and share it. Share it with somebody who you feel like could benefit from this information. Don't forget our mission at Gluten-Free Society is to help save 100 million lives. And uh, I take that mission very seriously. And I hope that if you're coming here week after week to learn that you're helping me reach those lives by sharing this information with people you care about. You can also come over and visit us at Gluten-Free Society and sign up for our newsletter. You can support us that way. We'll send you a bunch of free information on how to navigate autoimmune disease using diet, lifestyle, and exercise. And if you want to support us in another way, you can buy our products. We offer over a hundred different items um, in our gluten-free society store, number of different vitamin and mineral supplements and food-based supplements. We also offer lab testing for those of you who are interested in, in kind of pursuing some of this information. And for those of you who missed our Easter sale, um, you can you can um, take advantage of micronutrient testing today. Um, we have a, we have a sale. Um, that coupon code is give me fifteen to save 15%. So when you check out, just use that coupon code, give me 15. We've got a link up in the comments here for you to take advantage of that sale if you wanna get your micronutrient levels tested. So no matter how you support us, we appreciate you. We appreciate um, you showing up week after week and getting educated and sharing this information with those you care about. We'll see you next Tuesday. We're gonna be doing a, another crash course on Tuesday and uh, hope you have a fantastic weekend. Take care.